This week, learn how to decode METARs and start on the journey to making a surface station map like this one. Welcome to another MetPy Monday. Hello, I'm John Lehman, a software engineer for Unidata. This week we're going to start working towards making a surface map like this one that's got all the different symbols, wind barbs, and observations that we normally have on a surface chart. But to do that, first we need to get data. And getting surface data has traditionally been pretty difficult, really. These point sources are only distributed in the METAR format, which is an odd-looking text product from the days of teletype. If you haven't seen that before, We'll look at it as we go to process it, and you'll see that it's something that's not necessarily easy to do, but we've built in a parser into MetPy that makes that much easier for you and turns it into a pandas data frame, which we all know and love. So the first thing is, where can you get these observations? Well, the easiest way right now is to go to our threads test server, which is threads-test.unidata.ucar.edu. Once you're there, you see the nice new Threads 5 looking interface as compared to the Threads 4 that you might be used to on some of our other servers. If we go down to Test Datasets and NOAA Port Text Products, so these are plain text things that are coming across the NOAA Port system, and then METAR. So here we see all of these METAR files. It looks like we're going back roughly a month in this archive. Each one is only about a meg and a half or so. So these aren't very large, but this isn't really meant to be an archive server. It's more real time. So we're going to go ahead and grab this URL for the METAR catalog. So copy that to your clipboard because we will need it as we're using Siphon to access this. So in our Jupyter Notebooks, first thing we need is the Threads Data Server Catalog object from Siphon so we can programmatically access this data. You could just click those files on the Threads webpage and download them manually, but that could get tedious if you wanted to automate this or retrieve a lot of data. So from siphon.catalog, import TDS catalog. Then we'll create an instance of that and call it cat. And here's where we save that URL, or paste that URL. Now, it does have the HTML extension on it. This will work, but you'll get a warning that it is changing the extension to XML for you. So that's the machine-readable version of the catalog. So I'm going to go ahead and just change it to XML so I don't get that warning. Once the catalog has been retrieved, we can look and see what data sets are available. Notice this hasn't actually pulled any data down, just the metadata for the catalog. So if we call cat.datasets, here we can see all of the METAR files that we could ask for. And there are quite a few. I'm going to go ahead and get one of those as a data set. I'm just going to get the first one, or the zero with index. Now ideally, we could use remote open, so we would never have to actually download this to disk explicitly, but there's a small bug in Siphon that we discovered recently that will be fixed in the next release. It does mean that we can't use remote open here though, so we have to actually go ahead and download the file. So I'm going to pop open my file viewer here on the left side, which you can do by clicking the folder or pressing Control-B on your keyboard, and call ds download, which is a method of that data set. When I run that cell, it's going to go find the zeroth thing in that catalog, and it's actually going to download it to my disk. So we see it pop up here in our file viewer. If I click on it, we can see this is just plain text and a very weird format, and sometimes uh, a new version of JupyterLab gives us a little error there. This is not friendly to parse in any way, shape, or form. So back to our notebook. Let's go ahead and import that parser from MetPy. 
So from metpy.io import parse metar file. Now for the parse metar file function to work for us, we need to give it the name of the file that we want it to work on. I could go grab that explicitly from my disk using OS or pathlib, but I'm just going to call ds.name because we know that's going to be the name of the file that we downloaded. We still have that reference to ds in our memory. Parse metar file is going to give us a data frame back. So I'm going to stick with convention, call that df. Using tab completion there because typing is terrible. And then we pass it ds.name. This takes a second to run because there's a lot of string parsing going on. But now that it's done, if we look at the head of our data frame, we see that it's indexed by station. We've got station ID, lat long and elevation of the station, the date timestamp, wind direction, wind speed, current weather symbols. There are a lot of things here and not all of them are filled in because the different stations have different variables or not measured. Uh, but air temperature, dew point temperature, and altimeter are going to be some important ones. Also notice that wind speed and direction are normally reported as a speed and a direction in degrees. But when we're plotting or doing any math, we need the U and V components. So we've gone ahead and saved you the trouble of doing that. And we calculate eastward wind and northward wind components and put them in the data frame for you. Much like with soundings, the data frames don't play very well with units. Uh, so we have gone ahead and added the df.units attribute as well. So you can see what unit each of these quantities are in. And you could make those united arrays if you desired. For making a plot, that's not really so necessary, but it's nice to know, okay, that's in knots, not meters per second or miles per hour. And that the altimeter is still in, of course, inches of mercury. So we can go through and do some filtering. So if I wanted to just get readings from the station KMYJ, for example, I could index into my data frame where the station ID of my data frame is equal to the string KMYJ. And now if we look at the data frame for KMYJ, we see we've got three obs there. Uh, 2255, a 115, and a 135Z. You could also do some operations where you're only going to plot or look at data for, say, stations that are below freezing or close to freezing. So do that. Maybe I'll call my data frame data frame freezing. If you don't remember the units, uh, you could go back and look at the units attribute or remember that METARs report temperatures in degrees Celsius. So I'm going to index into the data frame again where the air temperature variable is less than or equal to zero. And so we could look at the, the head of that data frame. And if we go over to air temperature, everything should be zero or below. So our first row is minus five, minus three, minus two. So those are all of the stations that have freezing observations in this observation time period. So let's see how many unique stations there are that are below freezing, because there are going to be some repeated rows, as we just saw up here when we requested data from KMYJ. To do that, I want to use an F string and print out a, uh, a more human readable sentence instead of just some numbers after cells. I particularly want to do this because after teaching a recent workshop, I realized that the use of F strings is not as prevalent as I thought it would be. These are really awesome tools, and we've talked about them a little bit before on MetPy Mondays. So definitely go back and watch some of those videos if this is unfamiliar. So we're going to use our print function. And I'm going to proceed what I want to print with an F to say this is a formatted string. Now note this formatted string syntax was only introduced in Python 3.6. So if you're running anything older than that, you would need to upgrade to 3.6 or above. Uh, I'm running 3.7, as with 3.8, there's still some, some Windows Jupyter Lab interface issues at the, the time of this recording in January 2020. 
I'm going to use double quotes, and you'll see why in just a second. And then with an F string, we can type whatever we want in here. But when we use curly braces, so a dictionary looking syntax, we can put in the name of a variable, a function call, anything in there that we want to be formatted into that string. We can specify the formatting, but here we're not going to have to do that. I'm just going to be printing some simple integers. So I want to print the length of data frame underscore freezing. So of my freezing stations data frame, how many are there where the station ID is unique? So we call dot unique on the station ID data series of that data frame. And then we call len on that to see how many there are. And that's enclosed in curly brackets. Notice we're doing a method call. Uh, we've got all kinds of things going on in there, but it's okay. I'm then going to use a slash. And then I'm going to just print the length of the data frame. So how many unique stations are there out of the total number of rows in that data frame? We could do unique stations in that data frame if we wanted as well. So why did I use double quotes? It's because notice in these brackets here, when I'm indexing into the data frame, I'm using single quotes. If I'd used single quotes on the outside, the interpreter would get confused as to what quotes go with what. I could have used single quotes on the outside and double on the inside. This is just the convention that I like using. If I have to use double quotes or bad quotes as we call them, I like to use them on the outermost level. And we could add in some more human readable text here if we wanted. So stations are below freezing. Or maybe we'll say, yeah, stations are below freezing. We'll go with that. So now we see 1,687 stations out of 8,501 stations are below freezing. But that's not really accurate, right? It's 1,687 stations out of 8,501 rows in this data frame are below freezing. They're probably duplicate rows for different stations. So I'd like you to pause the video and go back and try to modify this F string now to correct this error. Okay, so how would I do that? I'm gonna go in our second number here since that's the one that has the problem. And in my data frame, I'm gonna index into station ID again. Notice I'm consistently using single quotes there. And now that I have all the station IDs as a data series, I'll call unique on that as well. So now we'll get unique stations that are freezing over unique stations that are not. Uh, so we've got 4,813, so that roughly halved that number. In this case, about a quarter of the stations were at or below freezing, which is not a terribly surprising number for this time of year over such a wide network as the Metarobs that come across through ASOS and other things on NOAA port. I hope that you found this useful and that you'll start parsing some METAR files that you get either from our thread server or already have as case studies. Next week, we'll continue to work with this surface station data and start making some basic maps. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on next week's MapPy Monday.